Glory to Jesus Christ. Slave Susu Christu. Good evening and welcome to our last, uh, our final class uh, in the reading of Mother Maria Skoptsova by Jim Forrest. And I hope this uh, this was the, the reading of the last chapters. I hope that you were able to accomplish them. Uh, I was hard pressed, uh, but um, I, I think it was worth, worth the effort. Uh, I think tonight will lend itself to a lot of good reflections from the last three readings from Mother Maria's own uh, translated words. Uh, but as usual, we will begin with a reading of a prayer, asking God to guide us uh, as we continue with our, our project, with our class. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son of your eternal Father, you have said with your most pure lips, without me you can do nothing. My Lord, with faith we hold in our heart and souls these words spoken by you. Help us to complete this book study for the glory of your holy name, for you are a good God who loves mankind. And we give glory to you, to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Slava Isusu Christu. Good evening once more. I'm going to type in here my email address, as I usually do, so that anybody who might be joining for the first time has that information. And I invite you to contact me and introduce yourself. Let me know who you are. Or you can even type it into the chat yourself. Any questions, anything at all. Uh, as we have gone through this book, I think we are getting a sense of the voice of Mother Maria and how she speaks. I We had an in-person uh, just a little bit earlier, and it was enjoyable to see. It was enjoyable to talk about, you know, how much of her humor, and I think if you read this a while, you start to get a sense of, of her humor, her voice, her personality, uh, how much it, it could be the translator or how much it could be her. And it seems so consistent that it, uh, I would like to think it, it's her that we're really getting uh, when it comes to the personality and the writings and the way in which she writes. Uh, she, we had the last three chapters, which, is, which are called, uh, chapter nine was, a justification of Phariseeism, a justification of Phariseeism. Chapter 10, insight in wartime. And the last one, types of religious life, where she, uh, where she captures five specific kinds of religious life and uh, outlines uh, and, and talks a bit about maybe the drawbacks of those life, details them a little bit, maybe their origins, where they come from. Uh, probably one of her strongest chapters, uh, perhaps deliberate by the author to include that one last, which was from 1937. In chapter nine, a justification of Phariseeism, it was interesting to see a justification of Phariseeism. Uh, it, it, this was in reference to the parable, the publican and the Pharisee. And in the publican and the Pharisee, right, you have these two individuals in a parable that Christ is telling in the Gospels. You have the Pharisee, who is the man up at the front, who is quite literally uh, pounding on his chest uh, in such a way to boast. It says that he prayed thus with himself, uh, saying that I fast, thank you, I fast, I tithe. So there's like a self-justification to his efforts. And he thanks the Lord that he is not like this publican. Right, this man in the back, who is a, a, a cheat, a tax collector, who has lived in the world and is of the world, and and the the publican says those words of uh, "Have mercy on me, a sinner." Okay, that we use so often in the church now. Uh, we're trying, to, we aspire to be like the publican. Ultimately, well, she has a, she does not take away the gains, uh, the benefits, um, the, the the lesson of the publican. Uh, but she goes further down the path of the Pharisee. What does it mean to be the Pharisee? Is, is, is there a complete loss there in being the Pharisee? And she credits the Pharisee a little bit because she sees in the Pharisee a value, okay, at least a value, something of value, right? What she sees, and she makes reference to it several times in this chapter, uh, she sees sort of a constant, right? When the world says, do not fast, the Pharisee fasts. 
when the world says, uh, do not tithe, do not give to the church, uh, a Pharisee says, do it, do it anyway, right? So there's, uh, sh she sees or, or tries to bring out this interpretation of the Pharisee uh, as something to, th th that helps the church in her constancy and her consistency, right? Uh, but ultimately falling short, right? Ultimately falling short. She says in, in, on the last page, she says on the last page of the chapter, she draws attention to the fact that the Pharisee, that the Pharisee ultimately is not receptive of God's fire, right? And I thought this was interesting, uh, right? As, as God being fire coming down from above, burning it all up. Uh, that when the prophets came, you know, the, the, the Pharisees of that time were, they, they saw this need to be constant in the church and that the prophets were ultimately shaking things up. You know, choice is bad. Right? This, that, that was pointed out too, that, uh, that from the time of the fall, you know, choice is bad because it leads to mistakes. So trying to remove choice from the equation, right? Uh, a, a, a comfortable constancy to religious life. Uh, they withhold, they, they uphold that, right? And then God sends a fire from above uh, and calls for repentance. Uh, it shakes things, every, shakes everything up. God is a fire, okay? And I thought that was a wonderful analogy because it brought to mind, we had a student who lived here and he uh, went to become a, a wildland firefighter. He received training for it, went out west for it and did it for a while. And it was interesting to learn from him the approaches of firefighting. Right, of wildland firefighting, which I'm sure in principle shares many things with, you know, being a city firefighter, but, but maybe not as many it, 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 to this point that a wildland firefighter doesn't just put out fires. They also set fires, right? If they are dealing with a fire that's out of control, they might do a controlled burn of certain areas. So to, so as to prevent future fires that are later, right? But, but this characteristic of a wildland firefighter, somebody who is constantly putting out fires, not just putting out fires, but also setting fires, which for me is, is, is the unlike characteristic. That's the part that's unlike the Pharisee, right? Pharisees uh, taking the literal form of firefighter as, as constantly putting out the fires, right? Uh, maybe we're called to be more like wildland firefighters, uh, not just putting out the fires, but lighting the fires too sometimes. I thought the, the, that one popped in my, in my head with the more that she talks about God as being fire and, and, and basically burning everything up. Uh, she says here on page 123, fire came down into the world. The word of God became flesh. God became man. Not for nothing and not by chance was this wonder, this fulfillment of the promised and the looked for, opposed precisely by those who were guardians of the promised looked for covenant. Almost an irony. Those who are, those who have been the guardians all along were his staunchest uh, uh, opponents, right? The ones who have been the protectors, uh, they see. And, and not for nothing draws to mind, brings to mind, the parable of the, the the vine dressers, right? Where the vine dressers are taking care of the vines. And then when the master sends his son, they kill the son, right? When he comes for the vines. So you have here this consistency with the gospel message that she is, uh, she's drawing attention to, a lot of consistency with the gospel message in talking about the Pharisee. So there is a justification of Phariseeism, not a complete justification, but an understanding, it seems, by Maria. Uh, by Mother Maria here. Yes. So I thought that was a that, that, it, it, quite a good chapter, a shorter chapter of the three, uh, quite a good chapter. And then you have on chapter 10, insight in wartime. And uh, she is in a time of war, right? You have the Second World War spreading across Europe, and she's already a survivor of the Russian Civil War. All of this was pointed out in the introduction of the chapter. And she paints this really strong image of uh, sand mixed in water in a glass, right? Uh, if the glass is shaken up and the water is stirring, the sand is, is floating and moving, right? But if the, as soon as the water becomes stagnant, it settles to the bottom. 
right? When the water grows still, the sand sinks to the bottom. There is much in our life, she says, that stirs up this heaviness and sluggishness. We are anxious over our struggle for material existence. Uh, and so she uses that as an example of, of the that when grief comes, she points it out in the, in the next page, uh, when more than grief, but the sudden realization of an esch eschatological realization, this realization of death, right? Eschatological meaning the study of death, um, the, the approach to death. And she has this Russian expression, the Lord has visited us. The Lord has visited us, which is a reference to a, a sudden revelation of the true essence of things, she says, uh, that the deadness of the whole creation, we have seen the life-giving, fiery, all-filling, all-burning, comforting spirit. She makes reference to when we, when somebody has died, when we attend a funeral, that there's a couple different kinds of people. There are the people who say the very nice and respectful things. And then there are, there are the people for whom reality is not the same anymore. Right there, there is an awareness of a deeper reality that has suddenly been opened up. She points these, the, 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 she juxtapositions kind of these two people, these two kinds of people. And you get a sense of almost her humor a little bit in the next uh, paragraph at the bottom of 127, where she says, Then time, the healer, they say, but wouldn't deadener be more correct? Time hastening our death. Uh, slowly smooths everything over, right? We leave the funeral, we leave the death of a loved one, and, and over time it heals us, right? Uh, but she points out to that, that time deadens us uh, kind of in her hum uh, humorous way. She has a very powerful and strong paragraph on the next page on 128. I'll read it out loud. She says, she speaks of a personal apocalypse. This is what she says, this, this awareness of death. The gates of eternity are open to us by way of a personal apocalypse. Personal eschatology abolishes time in which we are used to living and space by which we are used to measuring everything. And by somehow accepting these other laws, man is able to keep himself in eternity. The fall back into everyday life and a peaceful occupation with everyday things is by no means inevitable. Let them take their own course. Eternity can be seen through them. If man is not afraid, if he does not run away from himself, does not renounce his awesome, not only human, but divine human destiny, that is, his personal Golgotha, the hill on which Christ died, his personal bearing of the cross accepted by his own free will. Right? And at the very bottom, to put it more simply, a man's whole life will seem dull worthless, meaningless to him if it is not pierced through with the flame of eternity. That's a mic drop if ever I heard one. And she goes on from there very strongly to speak about the importance of uh, sort of an eschatological realization, right? A, a personal Golgotha, a personal Golgotha, a personal uh, sacrifice, life of sacrifice. Or, or rather awareness of death, I think is, is more the point to what she's making. And she says other things in the chapter. I want to point out on page 132, where she, spe where she speaks of imagining one's death. She says, try to imagine a real death in the middle of 132. Try to imagine a real death, and you will understand that your own life however modestly you evaluate its significance, is in some ultimate metaphysical sense greater than any national minorities or paid vacations or universal suffrage. Your life is greater and your death is greater. Test yourselves in this way and you will see at once that apart from this real and earthly struggle, you give your life to eternity for what is connected with eternity, that you need all of these freedoms and liberations because you want a free and creative spirit to reign in this heavy and enslaved world. Uh, the paid vacations, federations, and so on. These are all means while the goal lies at a completely different depth, right? Uh, that the, the, the enjoyment of life is simply that, enjoyment of life, uh, not necessarily the wages of a deeper reality. 
right? These are the things that help us to come through life, uh, but not to achieve eternal life. I think if I'm interpreting it right, this is what I'm getting. Uh, and so she has more to say. She even makes reference to an encyclical from the Pope of Rome at that time, who is saying things that are, she says, uh, his statement consists of carefully selected, humanly wise and noble statements, uh, an encyclical, a letter about the present situation in the world he must have given at the time and uh, that they published. And she, she says something that is, uh, I don't know what to call it, but there's almost a sense of her personality and humor here as well, where she says, I can say nothing against the Pope's encyclical, except that there was no great need for it. Which is, which is really saying something, uh, if nothing, if not nothing. Uh, she says, uh, it is the lack of fire, a lack of a breakthrough into other worlds. Nothing earth-shaking, I think, is the, uh, the approach, which, which is almost like a blunt, motherly thing to say. No, there is no great need for it, I think. Um, and her directness is, is quite refreshing, is very refreshing. Uh, and she points out the importance of having this I, I think in her message that directness is exactly what she's appealing for the this sort of directness to the spiritual situation of the world she says in page 135 uh halfway through we sense the religious catastrophe that threatens the world yet we have so long perceived religion as some noble national tradition that we now lack the energy to fill everything with its fire Right. So not seeing the faith for what it really is, which is fire uh, the, to, to heal this religious catastrophe that threatens the world. Uh, notions of war, she goes into, she speaks of the importance of spiritual, of spiritual care, of spiritual care, uh, especially in a time of death. She she has another thing that she says that is almost uh, again, you get a sense of her her humor, right? And, but her directness as well. The bottom of 135, that same page, she says, on the one hand, war is sin and misfortune and catastrophe. On the other hand, there is something egoistically vegetarian in consistent pacifism, which makes one sick at heart. Uh, again, you get a sense of how she is that she has a great passion. I mean, that you, she was a revolutionary uh, by study and by her, by her relationships in Russia before going to ultimately to France. And so you have this sense of, you have this uh, sense of strong passion uh, from her when it comes to uh, how far you will go for your brother or your sister, for her, uh, for your son or your daughter. Right. Because she is she said at one point that she became mother to all or that she felt uh, as being mother to all. And then in the last chapter on chapter 11, she goes into what she says are five different types of religious life. She calls them synodal, ritualist, aesthetical and ascetical. And then she presents her own ideal which is she calls the evangelical type, right? And I think that if, if that one can be summarized, uh, dare summarize it, it's, it seems to be that fire that she speaks of, that there is fire, this, this burning fire uh, that uh, from the time of uh, God's coming, uh, from the time of the creation of the world. Uh, she, when it comes to the synodal types, she, I think she's good in talking about the origin of these types of religious life. She speaks of the synodal life as, as really extending from this time in Russia when the, uh, and the synod for those, the synod is this council of bishops that uh, oversees the church, that, that, that administers uh, to the church, this, this group of bishops that have the authority uh, of, of the major decisions of the church. And the, uh, and so they were incorporated into the state at a certain level of the, the bureaucracy of the state. Uh, there was a nationalist, nationalism uh, 
nationalist approach to the faith. The faith was incorporated into it. So to be, you know, part of the state, there had to be at least at some level, some, some obedience to the faith, some level. Uh, she speaks of the need to even have a, um, a certificate. She says at the bottom of 143, she says that certificates being issued uh, to civil functionaries certifying that they had been to confession and communion. Since without such a certificate, the functionary could not be considered a loyal subject from the state's point of view. So you have this merging of the two, right? And she points out drawbacks to these things uh, on page 147. She speaks of a uh, she says at the, at the top of 147, the synodal type of religious life, which promoted other values along with spiritual ones, namely those of the state, of a way of life and of a particular tradition, not only distorted and confused the hierarchy of values, but often simply replaced love, Christian love, with an egotistical love for the things of this world. So it is changing a, a redeeming love for uh, a love unto death, a, um, an egotistical love, a self-centered love. So uh, I think that's, so ultimately she's not endorsing the synodal life of the church. She sees in it certain drawbacks. She points out the ritual type of, uh, of religious life. And I think she really captures that one on the bottom of 149 in the last paragraph where she says, we are dealing here with belief of a particular kind of magic, not just of a word, a name, but of each letter that makes up the name. And she points out uh, old believers, right? Uh, a frightful retribution has been visited upon the old believers for their treatment of Christ's truth. She makes reference to, uh, and if you don't know who they are, you can look these up, uh, but there were reforms in the church that they did not accept. Uh, they're called the Nikonian reforms. That happened, I believe, in the 1700s, 18th century. And... Uh, they would not accept them, the change of the way that you, uh, the, the cross yourself, but there's many other reforms. Uh, but there was a, the, there became this ritualistic approach to, uh, this ritualistic approach to the faith that removed faith almost again, became kind of a type of magic that, uh, that things are affected by the way in which you do something, right? That that's magic. Right. There's that's magic. Things are effected that are made to happen in a way. So she is um, she sees the drawbacks of that particular religious life of ritual life. She goes into the aesthetic type uh, of religious life and she sees in here again drawbacks. She says on page 157, aesthetic criteria gradually replace the spiritual and eventually displace all other considerations. The people in the church are looked upon as either a crowd of worshipers, props needed for the proper rhythm of worship, or as tedious and annoying barbarians who by their ignorance, clumsiness, and occasionally by their personal sorrows and special needs, encroach upon the general grandeur and orderliness of the service. So the, the very people you seek to serve become the obstacles, uh, become our obstacles, right, in this, uh, in this particular approach, this aesthetic. Uh, because people are messy. People are messy, right? We are messy. Uh, she points out the ascetic type of religious life, that it's not unique to Christianity, right? Uh, that it has uh, existed in every religion, right? And we know this in Hinduism and Buddhism and, and uh, many different religious paths, that there is an asceticism, right? And so she points out that... Uh, this particular ascetic type has its roots not in Christianity, but rather in the Eastern religions that has entered Christianity as a sort of a special influence from these religions, modifying the original understanding of it. Uh, the, the yogis uh, of Hinduism and these things, uh, she speaks of uh, one can achieve tremendous psychic changes within oneself and a mastery over matter and spirit, just as gymnasts must exercise, uh, just as wrestlers must follow a regimen, just as singers must practice scales. So ascetics of this type must follow specific directions, exercise, repeat the same routine over and over and maintain a special diet. Uh, it's by the principle of consolidating one's natural talents, she says. And so at the bottom, 
what answer can be given on this particular form of spiritual natural naturalism the only thing in this world more powerful than this is the church's teaching about spiritual poverty about the spending the squandering of one's spiritual powers about the utmost impoverishment of the spirit uh and she says that uh, there is no doubt but, but that an occult relationship to asceticism which is contrary to christianity has been introduced into our piety by way of ancient eastern influences through syria and her particular type of religiosity at that time and age uh i think she sees in it uh, another obstacle that the purposes of the asceticism that uh, creeps into it uh is inconsistent with the impoverishment the spiritual poverty that is called for right and then the last one that she uh really sees as the um as the uh the type that we aspire to or ought to aspire to as christians is the evangelical type evangelical type where she uh, goes into talking about uh this particular type is as eternal as is the proclamation of the good news always alive within the bosom of the church shining for us in the faces of saints and at times lighting with the reflection of its fire, even righteous people outside the church. Uh, here, one must immediately introduce a clarification so as to prevent well-intentioned or deliberate misinterpretations of the evangelical way of religious life. She goes on uh, about those particular things. Uh, the two commandments, to love God and to love our fellow man, everything else, even the commandments and the Beatitudes, is merely an elaboration of these two commandments, right? That, uh, that there can be a summary and a life uh, devoted to that summary. Of the life. Uh, this was a very powerful reading. I hope that um, anybody else who who who, uh, who read this uh, gained from it, or or at least were stirred up to wonder what we what is our life, right? Having read the words of Mother Maria, uh, what is our life in reflection of of the priorities that she sets out? She sets out to she sets down the path of love of neighbor. Uh, taking it as far as she can, right? Seeing in it uh, the distance which Christ went, which is laying down his life for fellow man. So what was fellow man? Uh, he identifies, right? God identifies with fellow man. In as much as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, in the Gospel of Matthew at the judgment, you did it to, to, to me. You did it to me. So she sees in it, uh, taking from another chapter, a mystical element to human communion, which means... Uh, there can be no bound there can be no limit uh in love of our neighbor uh, of our brothers and sisters seeing in them uh not just the icon of christ but somebody worthy of our love and our every effort uh if you're like me you're it's it stirred up thoughts and uh and hope uh for, and and maybe even a, a level of of uh repentance maybe even a level of repentance for how we may have lived our life and maybe what more we can do. Uh, may God bless you this evening. I hope this finds you well. And uh, may God bless you. Um, and uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We will be taking a break from our readings and uh, for the next couple of weeks. And we'll resume on Wednesday, September 28th uh, with the book, the Way of the Pilgrim, and the Pilgrim continues his way. I'm ordering copies for the church here, so you're welcome to buy them from here, or you can buy them uh, on Amazon. There are many different editions out there. Uh, it is a fairly popular book. Uh, it is more of a storybook quality. Uh, there's a narrative and a, and, um, a dialogue and, and characters, um, but I think it has a lot to offer us um, in teaching us about, specifically a prayer that called the Jesus Prayer, um, but it teaches us a lot about the prayer life of the church. So uh, that is our next book, uh, The Way of the Pilgrim, and the Pilgrim Continues His Way. We'll resume on September 28th, on Wednesday, September 28th. May God bless you, uh, and, uh, and a good night.